thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I also would like uh, to thank for the opportunity uh, to present uh, my work at this Rakis conference. And also, I would like to say that I'm very happy uh, to be here and that the, uh, despite the current situation that the conference uh, still was uh, set on. Uh, so, the topic I would like to uh, present today is a recent uh, work which you can find on the archive where I um, developed um, methods which I have good reasons to believe to be quite uh, universally applicable to many, many cases which allows one to prove the convergence of um, form factor series expansions in the singe gordon quantum field theory in one plus one dimensions. So basically, well, this kind of form factor series, what it is, it is a series uh, which represents the correlator, uh, and the sum of the series is given by a n-fold integral. So to uh, statutate about the convergence, you need to uh, determine how the n-fold integral appearing in the n-fold sum grows, uh, grows with n, and uh, the whole work was about developing the method allowing one to do so. Uh, and as I said, uh, because of certain universal features present in the method, it has good reasons to be applicable to many other instances of um, series of multiple integral representations in, uh, say, for correlation functions. So, uh, well, I will start the talk by first um, presenting the main uh, structural uh, theorem I obtained in this work, but first of all I'd like to uh, say a few words why should we even uh, care about proving things like convergence of some representations. Then after having uh, described the main uh, results, I've described its uh, applications. So the first one is to prove the convergence of the uh, form factor series expansion in the singe gordon field theory. Uh, and for that, I would like to spend a few moments uh, in recalling the um, uh, bootstrap program construction of the form factors and the singe gordon models for us to uh, set up all this in, a, in, in the convenient framework. And then I also would like to uh, comment a bit about uh, maybe uh, more long distance goals of this work, which deal with uh, pushing the borders of special function uh, theory, and I'll be more clear about that at that time. And then, depending on time, I'll try to give a few ideas about uh, the techniques that were used in the proof. I will not go into any, any details, but maybe just highlight the main steps. Uh, and for that, in particular, uh, because the method can be seen as a sort of sophistications of the techniques which are applied in random matrix theory, I will uh, briefly review uh, what, what is uh, the scheme of um, obtaining the large n behavior of n-dimensional integrals issuing from certain ensemble of random matrices, and that's it. So, um, well, uh, let me start with, with the convergence. Uh, so, um, of course, if we are just doing algebraic manipulations, some finite number of multiplications, additions, uh, in some ring, everything is well, well defined. Sometimes we can use some specific properties of the ring to recast such a um, set of symbols into something more, more compact. But then, uh, well, very often, uh, at some point, we want to take a, a limit. And this is where we leave the realm of uh, algebra to, towards analysis. And, uh, well, it might seem a completely harmless way to have a finite sum and just push the limit of the sum to infinity. But it can pose actually quite a few uh, problems. So let's suppose we have some... Uh, uh, so, so, so basically then, then it's the question, if, if we can write an object, is this uh, sufficiently enough to claim that the object itself exists. And if we have a series, well, if the series is very well uh, convergent, like series of 1 over n squared, then there's no problem. 
the series is commutatively convergent. You can sum up the sum in whatever way you want. So if for some reason you want to sum them up in a completely different order than the natural order, one, two, three, and etc., you can. You will always get the same result. And in this case, you have many, many ways to prove it's by square over six. But if you uh, deal with series which are not absolutely convergent, like minus 1 to the n over n, then basically you can get whatever uh, number you want, including minus and plus infinity, depending on the way you sum up the numbers. So, uh, for instance, if you consider uh, that you will sum up with an order given by some permutation uh, of the integers, and you consider permut infinite dimensional permutation, so if you consider a permutation which is dominantly even, so by this I mean a permutation which will dominantly uh, put you uh, only uh, even numbers at the beginning. So uh, you would have uh, uh, maybe 2, 4, up to 4m, then you have 1, then you have uh, 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 2 uh, 2m, 2m plus 2, and then very, very far away you put the 3, and etc. Then basically, uh, summing up with such a uh, permutation of the elements, you basically, everything happens basically as if you would be summing up the, taking the limit of the sum of the first big n even uh, integers, and then of course you get plus infinity. And if you would ref refine slightly better the permutation, you could get anything. Of course, if you sum up with just the permutation which preserves the natural order in n, then you get minus uh, log of 2, as one would expect. So already it means that with non-absolutely convergent series, you have to be very careful. You have to be careful about the order in which you sum up the things. And also, depending on the object you consider, then some series representations may be just much better than others. Some series representations may lead to divergent, divergent quantities, or at least badly controlled quantities. But other series, for instance, if you take this sum and you just uh, first represent it as a sum where you sum the uh, odd and even part, and you put them together, then you get, again, an absolutely convergent series, and there is, there is no problem. Uh, so, uh, so okay. So this were just uh, toy examples. Let me now pass to things a bit more uh, complicated. Well, uh, first maybe a classical example I can give about convergence problem is the convergence of perturbative expansion in quantum field theory in general. You cannot do it in. Uh, you cannot just expand in a perturbative series and hope to get. A, finite results, you have to be very careful in that. And actually, you have to devise very specific series expansions for averages in a um, QFT, uh, which take the good perturbative form in the end. And this is basically the renormalization scheme. And if you do something else, then you get just nonsense. Uh, of course, one can argue that, well, maybe this is some kind of very exotic problem, which is related to the fact that those theories have very say, a few uh, structures, um, algebraic structures behind, uh, no, no large uh, uh, algebra of symmetries. And then if you would go to uh, quantum integrable models and you would deal with some series of multiple integral representations, that such problems with uh, delicacy with convergence should never arise. And basically, whenever you get some representation for an object, then it just exists. Uh, well, let me take the example of the XLC spin one half chain. Uh, for instance, you compute the ground state expectation value of a dynamical sigma z sigma z correlation function between site one and n plus one, uh, where this sigma z is evolved in the uh, Heisenberg picture. Then, well, you have since the beginning of the 80s, there were a throng of series of multiple integral representations devised for these objects of very, very different types. So basically, you sum up over n, then you have a multiple integral of order a n. a n is some sequence going to infinity. Well, typically, a n is just n, but in some cases, it's something more, more complicated. You integrate over some curve in a complex plane with an uh, integrand that uh, couples all the integration variables and depends on the parameters of the, of the model. And I use the shorthand notations for vectors 
uh, with index n, meaning it's an n-dimensional vectors. Well, the first series for such objects were obtained between 82 and 85 by Isaacin and Karepin. Um, they were actually pioneering the, the field at the, uh, at the time. So uh, the results were quite uh, spectacular that they could bring it to, uh, to the end. But uh, they were uh, then doing several amounts of uh, resumations and exchanges of symbols in their uh, computations. And the first series they obtained, they were exhibiting some kind of very strange feature because uh, they were showing that actually, uh, uh, if one sets to the static uh, uh, two-point function, they were giving uh, uh, kind of predictions from some form of asymptotic analysis they did do on the level of their series, that the two-point function actually exhibits near and far long distance asymptotics. So when the distance is large but not very large, it has one type of large distance behavior, and then this large distance behavior changes when one goes for really very far, big diff distances. And of course, this is not uh, the case. It was some wrong conclusion which was made. And uh, the reason it was made is that the series which was used for arriving to this conclusion was not convergent. And simply uh, extracting this kind of behavior from the first terms of the series, they, because they were claiming the series were rather well ordered for the large, uh, in the large end. Behavior could not be wrong, because it uh, could not work, because actually, well, there were uh, contributions, counterterms coming from infinity because of the lack of convergence. Actually, in integrable models, one can, uh, uh, and again, I mean, it's not a criticism of Isaac and Karepin work. They, it was very hard at the time to write anything about the correlation function. So, but I just want to stress that the, the type of problems you can, you can meet. Uh, and well, since then, actually, uh, if one looks very uh, precisely, then there were other examples of ill-defined series representations for correlation functions. So really, the, the question whether a given representation does give uh, a convergent series is something uh, important. Well, the only proof, well, of course, there is one case where one can prove convergence of uh, form factor series, uh, of series of multiple integral representation for correlation functions. It's the representations at the free Ferdinand point. Uh, but then, usually, this is done using Hadamard uh, uh, bound for determinants. And this stems from the fact that at the free fermion point, the integrands take a very, very simple form. It's just given in terms of simple uh, determinants. Whereas for any uh, truly interacting quantum integrable models, you have a coupling between all the variables, and no simple bounds can lead to some conclusion about convergence. Actually, this whole proof of convergence in an interacting model uh, is due to Smirnov somewhere in the 90s, where he managed to prove the convergence of a form factor series expansion for some specific correlator in the Li Yang model. So basically, uh, the, the, the open problem, uh, the open existing problem with all this highlights is uh, to establish some techniques for proving convergence of series representation for correlation functions in truly interacting quantum integrable models uh, regarding to the, all the series which were obtained since the, the 80s. Be, be it either on the lattice uh, model side or on the massive quantum integrable field theory side. Good. So after this introduction, let me discuss a bit the uh, main structural theorem I uh, established. So, for reasons which will be apparent uh, a bit later, I was interested in this uh, n-fold multiple integral. So, uh, the integral runs over Rn, uh, where the integration variables are betas. Uh, the integral depends on two auxiliary parameters, R and alpha, which appear uh, in this uh, one body confining potential. So R is strictly positive. Then we have a cosh beta A minus alpha sinh beta A term. Alpha is strictly lower than one. So all this ensures that individually in each of the beta A variables, we have an extremely fast convergence exponent of the exponent uh, at infinity. Uh, and actually, you can think, uh, for reasons which will also appear here slightly later, that all this term actually is some sort of space-time evolution. 
Then, uh, the, there is a two-body interaction between the integration variables uh, with the potential uh, W, which takes this explicit form. It's not really important what is the precise expression for the potential, but just maybe keep in mind it depends on some auxiliary parameter uh, B, and, uh, and that's it. And uh, the potential I have depicted it here for some typical values of B. It typically has uh, this, this kind of shape. It goes to zero at infinity, and it has a logarithmic divergence. Uh, uh, it goes logarithmically to zero, um, close to zero. So it means that this term has a double uh, zero when beta A goes to beta B. Yeah, it goes Oh, sorry, yeah, it goes like um, log uh, lambda close to lambda equals zero. So then this gives a uh, uh, second order zero at beta a equals beta b after taking the exponent. So after the two body interaction, there is also a non trivial uh, coupling between uh, involving all the uh, inter integration variables, uh, defined in terms of the modulus square of the function kn, uh, which uh, evaluates on some other function p, and which depends on all the integration variable. So this kn is given by some combinatorial sum. The sum runs over the all possible choices of n-dimensional vectors ln, whose coordinates are, uh, whose individual coordinates are either equal to 0 or to 1. There is a, a product coupling all the um, integration variables involving, again, this parameter b, the difference of the associated uh, components la minus lb of the vectors l given here, and divided by sinh of beta a minus uh, beta b. Then there is some kind of signature of the combinatorial sum term, which is an oscillate, uh, oscillating sign depending on the choices of la. And then this uh, function p, which is a function of the choices of the vectors ln and possibly of the beta uh, First, well, in principle, Kn has a double pole, has a pole at beta a equals uh, beta b, so the modulus square double pole, but because we have a double zero here at beta a equals beta b, the integral is well defined. And you can easily see that basically, well, depending on the hypothesis you put on p, but if p has a growth like exponent of some modulus of beta, a to some power k, then all this integral is well defined in convergence because of the e to the minus r Cauch growth at infinity. So this is the integral I am interested in. And then the theorem is that if we assume that the pn functions is bounded uh, uniformly, uh, that there exists some constant c1 and c2 such that p, uh, p is bounded by a given constant to power n, and then by a product of uh, e times the second constant c2 times the variables beta to some power k, k some integer, then, well, first of all, the integral is well defined. And then given any choice of uh, number kappa 0, the series over n of this un of r alpha converges uniformly uh, in the variable kappa being equal r times 1 minus alpha, belonging to um, the semi-infinite interval kappa 0 plus infinity. Moreover, one has an upper bound on this uh, un of r, which is explicit, and takes the form exponent times minus 3 pi to the fourth over 4, n square over log n to the cube, b, b hat, plus some 1 over log n corrections. So the two comments I, I, I should make is that first, you see that the leading bound does not depend on the, any values of a, a and alpha, and one would be tempted to just uh, then say that we can just push this uniform convergence up to zero. But in fact, there is an a and alpha dependent in the, in the remainder. And when, a, uh, when, and when this parameter kappa goes to zero, then the remainder blows up, and the bound is not true anymore. Uh, the second point is that. Uh, well, one could be tempted to say that, well, the integral should converge because there is a 1 over n factorial here, so it's a rather big number. But uh, this is, uh, uh, but you see that uh, actually the upper bound on the integral is slightly sub-Gaussian. Well, luckily there's a minus term, so all is fine, but uh, it, it grows basically like e to the constant time n squared. Constant can be positive or negative. 
So it means that basically this one over n, n factorial doesn't help you at all for typical n-dimensional multiple integrals, which involve couplings between all the variables, because those types of integrals grows like a e to the constant time n squared. The constant is either positive or negative. Uh, so uh, that's it about uh, about the result. And then let me discuss a bit about uh, the uh, Singe Gordon uh, bootstrap program. Well, first of all, if you want to construct maybe just generally, and then I, I, I'll try to, to, to discuss this in the level of applications to the Singe Gordon model, if you want to construct some quantum field theory, then basically we should construct in a way which is comparable, compatible with the scattering data, data we have. Uh, otherwise, we'd, 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 uh, we should first find some Hilbert space on which we can realize the uh, asymptotic particles of the model. Uh, we should be able to realize the symmetry, the various symmetry algebras we uh, want to enforce in the CFT, in, in the QFT. So, for instance, the, the realizations of boosts, space translations, or any other internal symmetries you want to have. And then on the space, you should uh, realize a set of uh, local operators, which, would which are supposed to represent some physically measurable uh, quantities. And these operators should form an algebra. So this is already a quite delicate point. Uh, up to that, it's uh, maybe uh, quite immediate. But the point is that the operators, you basically want to, uh, them to be uh, operators which take values and distributions, and which also are uh, genuinely unbounded, even if you forget about the distribution part of the operator. So uh, you want to be able to multiply the operators. And because they are just defined on dense uh, subspaces of the Hilbert space, it may already happen that uh, all the intersection of the dense uh, spaces you have uh, is just zero, so you cannot even multiply the operators. So uh, you, you should be able already to prove that you can uh, multiply the operators so that they have at least the intersection of their domains is some dense subspace of the Hilbert space. And, well, the, all this should be constructed in such a way that the theory is causal. You can impose it from the very start, from the axioms you put, but you can also deduce it as a consequence of some axioms you will put in, 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 the, in the model. And this is actually the picture, the point of view from, for the bootstrap approach. So what you want is that if you take two local operators and you compute the commutator, so here already you need to be able to multiply them to, to, to make sense of the commutator, and then if you consider operators which are space-like separated, then the commutator should uh, vanish. And then, well, the, 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 the next part of the program is to determine the multipoint point correlation functions, which should give you the measurable amplitudes in your, in your model. So, uh, so this kind of uh, program, um, uh, so, so, so I will discuss now how, how, how all this is implemented for the uh, since Gordon, one plus one dimensional quantum field theory. So this model deals with uh, constructing the Q quantum field theory, which is associated, which could correspond to the quantization of this uh, classical uh, evolution equations in one plus one dimension, the elimbrations of phi plus m square over g sinh of g phi, g being the coupling constants equals zero. And uh, out of this coupling constant here, you cook up some alternative uh, constant b, uh, which takes this form and that ranges between 0 and, and 1 half. And this is actually the b I highlighted in the slides uh, I started with. So uh, the history of this, um, of constructing this uh, QFT uh, explicitly and actually of all the uh, bootstrap program for integrable models started with Glianik and Vergelev in 76, who gave a certain amount of arguments that the quantum field theory should contain only one asymptotic uh, species of particles which have no internal degrees of freedom. So then it means that, well, for the Hilbert space, you can label the Hilbert space by the uh, asymptotic particles of your model, and then it's a Fox space of L squares, L square spaces of uh, Rn, uh, which have ordered rapidities, which correspond that we, 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 we um, label the Hilbert space with the incoming uh, 
asymptotic particles rapidities, so they have rapidities beta 1, beta 2, up to beta n. And then any element of a given uh, uh, space in the fog at the direct sun uh, can be seen as an incoming n particle wave packet. And if you want to slightly simplify the situation, you can take the limit when basically you have just plain waves going in and then such plain wave uh, uh, formal uh, uh, element, I will just denote it by a n of beta beta n. So Zekulis and Pianik um, proposed the following uh, S matrix for the scattering of the asymptotic particles. Uh, so it's a purely diagonal scattering given by a ratio of two hyperbolic tangents. Uh, yeah, and so I repeated the definition of B. Uh, then this model is endowed with a translation operator, which acts on the element of the Hilbert space, so it's a constant function, uh, function in L square over N, and etc. Uh, on each of the components of the uh, infinite uh, vector, it acts as a multiplication operator, which spits the uh, momenta of the individual particles, uh, um, Minkowskian scalar product with the uh, translation element uh, Y, so the momentum is M cos beta m sinh beta, and the space-time position is t x. Okay, so once the Hilbert space is constructed, one should say something about local operators. And the main idea in the bootstrap program is um, to provide a set of axioms. Uh, and these set of axioms allow you to, cons to fully characterize the local operators in the model. So maybe the, the starting point of this uh, of the use of this bootstrap uh, axiom uh, program should be uh, attributed to Karowski and Weich, who uh, used some of the general features of the two particle scattering properties uh, to uh, apply it to the St. Gordon case, and they were able to write uh, some expressions for some uh, matrix elements of certain operators in the sine Gordon model for in the connecting the vacuum in a two particle sector. And then basically maybe the, 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 the theory underwent a, a huge development mainly under the works of Fedosmanov, uh, who uh, built on the um, quantum Leviton Machenko um, equations and the newly developed quantum in the scattering methods to actually complete this uh, set of axioms into something uh, allowing you to really fully fix the operator content of such uh, models. Well, important works were also the works of Kirillov and Smirnov, where the full set of axioms were uh, stated for the first time, but it was clearly a consequence of also the works of Smirnov. And there was also an important input of uh, Khamitov, who proposed that actually this kind of set of axioms is already enough to prove um, the causality property of the theory. Uh, and then this was also used by Kirillov and Smirnov in a much more general setting. Okay, so then how it works? Well, we have a Hilbert space, which is a direct sum of L square spaces, and we want to uh, write the action of an operator or um, on, on the vectors of this space. So let's first look what it gives, uh, what is the component of the action of some operator or on this uh, function f, which has uh, components in the zero particle space, first particle space, and etc. And then we look at the component of the action of this operator on the zero particle space. Then, well, of course, when functions are in L square, so basically how do you how you would realize the operator? The operator will be an integral operator. So we take the input functions. Uh, then we have some integral kernels, which would depend on the operators, and then some piece depending on x. But actually, this piece you can all already deal by using that you have local operator and translation invariance in your theory, so that it factors out into pure plane wave factors. Well, you should integrate over order beta because this is how your L square space is. This corresponds to the ordering of the betas for your incoming particles, and you should sum up over all the components of this vector f, acting in this way over each component, uh, and that's it. 
And already, I mean, part of the properties you impose on these objects is that this integral kernel, well, if some functions of the betas, but actually it's the plus, so upper boundary value of a function uh, fm, depending on the operator you choose, which is meromorphic in the uh, some uh, n-dimensional n-dimensional uh, subspace of C to the n, uh, which is called the physical uh, strip. So we do have some sets of balls uh, and, and, and some other, other properties, but uh, uh, yes, so beta 1 tends to zero z uh, imaginary positive um, zero imaginary path, beta 2 tends to positive imaginary path, mm -hmm. and, and etc. And well, the action of uh, this operator all now on the n particle space, uh, it takes a very similar form. So we act on the components on the vectors, some overall components, but now we have an integral kernel MO, well, which would depend on the distance, but actually this uh, space time distance will factor out through translation invariance, and it will act on the variables, uh, integrated variables beta m, but n will split up some dependence on the exit, uh, output variables. Well, and of course, in terms of uh, matrix elements, if you want to use this pure, purely plane wave uh, uh, representations for the asymptotic particles, then you can formally write that this actually this building block of the action of this operator is the matrix element. You understand it as the formal matrix element of the operator all be between the incoming wave packets with rapidities beta 1 up to beta n and uh, incoming wave packets with uh, and likewise, the uh, matrix, the, the, the integral kernels defining the action on the n particle space, it's a matrix element of the operator, or between some incoming uh, wave packets of rapidities beta 1, beta n, alpha 1, alpha m. Okay. And then comes the set of axioms which allow you to uh, fully determine the operator, that is, compute these functions and these functions. Uh, so the first axiom is that you can reduce the action on the multiple multiparticle space. So basically, the integral kernel for the multiple particle space, you can move the first alpha 1 appearing here into the sets of the betas. You get something like this, but you have to add a pi pi. And then you have some sum uh, involving the S matrix of the model, some delta functions, and a reduction in the number of variables of the integral kernel by one in the alphas and by one in the betas, and then you can push it to just move all the alphas to the right, and that's it. Uh, and you get some combinatorial sum. So, once you move all the alphas to the right, then it means that you you did the first axiom fully characterizes M as long as you know F. So then you need axioms to figure, fix the uh, action on the output action on the zero particle space. So this Fn should satisfy uh, an exchange property. So if you exchange two rapidities beta a, beta a plus one, then uh, you get the Fn with the exchange rapidities after the multiplication by this matrix. Then you have an axiom which can be called back and forth. So if you just analytically continue from beta 1 to beta 1 plus 2 i pi, the uh, form factor, then you get the same form factor, but when you move beta 1 to the very end. And then the fourth axiom is the pole structure. So as a meromorphic function in this um, uh, multidimensional strip, uh, the e form factor will have uh, one dimensional residue, so if we take two variables, uh, two of the variables of f, and we can take their residues when the two variables are shifted by i pi, then we get, um, then we get something in non trivial, a reduction in the number of rapidities for the form factor, and some free factor. And these are all the axioms in the case of the Sinch Golden model because there are no more poles in the uh, S matrix, so no other bound states. Okay, so then of course, I mean, once you have this set of axioms, you want to solve for them. This was also a very 
uh, long story how to uh, find these um, solutions. Well, started, as I uh, said, with the works of Carol Squires. Then there was a among the input of uh, Smirnov between 84 and 92 to devise techniques for solving it, and also Kirill of Smirnov in these, these years. So all these work dealt with the sine golden model, which is definitely more complex than the Sinch golden model. Uh, mm, uh, and then what, what, is, what is the overall procedure uh, for solving gas systems uh, in the Sinch golden case? Well, first, you uh, represent the solution in a certain way. So you write it as a prefactor, which involves only two-body interactions, which actually takes care of uh, axioms two and three. Uh, so that in such a way that um, uh, the functions Pn, which, you, uh, which multiply this prefactor, uh, are simply twice by periodic in each of the variables, and symmetric. So this is some form of simplification. You have some integral representation for the f, but it's relevant here. Just you need to know that uh, f of beta times f of minus beta is this e to the w. And the w I introduced in the beginning. Uh, and, and then uh, well, many people have uh, contributed to giving some expressions for these kns. So in 91, Zamorogikov uh, considered the Lian model, and he was able to write determinant representations for Kn, basically in terms of determinants of symmetric functions and the exponents of the Bekas for specific choices of operators in the Lian model. Concerning the St. Gordon model, uh, Fring, Musato, Simonetti, and Kubek Musato relied on the construction of Zamorogikov and were able to provide similar determinant representations for certain specific operators in Sinch uh, for this uh, GM. And then maybe the, 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 the next important development arrived with the invention of the free field realization of form factors by Lucano in 95, who wrote these GMs, actually not only for Sinch Gordon, this method can be applied to many other cases, as to the expectation value of um, uh, free fields. Uh, so this allows already to produce uh, much uh, more representations for the KNs. And in particular, in 1980, with Brashnikov, uh, Lukianov uh, considered the St. Jordan case for the exponent of the field uh, terms for this KN. And uh, the constructions of Lukianov were dealing with um, sort of primary fields, but uh, then uh, those people more recently considered how to uh, then push kind of free field realization also to encompass the uh, KN functions for descendants of primary fields. Uh, and finally, the method I want to mention, and this is the method which, which interests me uh, here, is the P function method, which can be seen as actually a sort of refinement of the Lukianov of free field realization. Which was introduced by Dr. Jan Fring, Carol in 1999 on the example of Sine Gordon, but can be very well adapted to Sine Gordon. It was done uh, here. And this method actually tells you that this function is Kn. You can write them as some transform Kn. Exactly the transform I use here. So some transform where you shift the unknowns, no, you put all the information in the function p. The point is that the functions p satisfy much simpler properties than uh, what the prefactors kn should satisfy. And then uh, different choices of the functions p give you access to different operators and you can actually construct quite a good bunch of operators like this. So, uh, so then, well, putting together all these achievements, especially using the plus p function representation, uh, what was argued by uh, the various authors, that the exponent of the field, e to the gamma phi, a form factor, uh, it takes the form of this p factor with two body interactions, times this kn transform of the function pn of gamma, which takes the following form, some constant depending on the coupling constant of the model raised to the power n, and then the product a goes from 1 to n of some prefactor times minus 1 to the la. And as I said, other operators, uh, which can be found in, in the work factor, uh, just corresponds to other pn functions. So 
if you then apply it to a form factor vacuum, two-point function form factor expansion in the space-like regime. So uh, for space-like separated operators, what you do, well, you, you insert the complete set of states between the operator, psi zero is the vacuum of the theory, then you should sum up over all intermediate states, so all in intermediate n particle uh, rapidities integrate in an ordered rate over the rapidities, uh, and that matrix element of all between no particles and uh, incoming particles with rapidities be n. So this is exactly the form factor I uh, introduced before, the, it's plus boundary value on R. And you have a dual uh, form factor of uh, between incoming particles with rapidities beta 1, beta n, and no particles at all. And using the axiomatics of the theories, it's actually related to the same form factor, but uh, with um, uh, the minus boundary value uh, here. And then to simplify, so Maybe let me comment uh, that uh, form factors are generally basically bounded objects in the betas. So in itself, already these integral integrals, they are uh, very weakly convergent objects because well, you have something that oscillates maybe very fast if x and t's are not equal, but it's just oscillatory convergence, and so it's like an oscillatory Riemann integral. But uh, if you symmetrize, and you're allowed to symmetrize because of the absence of the theory, uh, and you effectively deform the integration contour to something uh, uh, shifted by i pi over 2 times the sine of x, and you use that you are in the space like regime, and you use also that form factors are globally translation invariant. Here, I shift all the integration variables equally by i pi. Then you end up with uh, this series representation for the two point function. Uh, and then uh, here you have already, already something absolutely convergence. And convergence is achieved by moving the integrals to some complex, um, to a curve in the complex, uh, to some line parallel to R in the complex plane. Uh, and that's it. So actually here you already recognize the integral I introduced in the, in the beginning once one writes the explicit expression for. So, so you need the space-like separation only for the fact. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes, and if you actually, for time like, you can also uh, deal with the convergence, but you have to deform the integration contours not, um, uh, because in the time like regime, basically, you will get that the stitch is dominating, because t will be larger than x in absolute value, and depending on the sign of t, you need to integrate. So here, I integrate over. Um, yeah. over a straight line. So in principle, it's a structurally simpler integral, but uh, in the space-like regime, one should integrate over a line which would change sign depending if you go to minus infinity or plus infinity. Uh, ch change the sign of the imaginary part. So you can also regularize the integrals in the time-like regime, but you will integrate here over a line of this, this sort. Um, Okay, and so as I said, well, the, the, the n fold integral I analyzed is this one. You have the convergence of the series. The convergence is actually very fast. So, uh, as I said, it's almost Gaussian decay in n of the sum. Uh, and the leading term of the Gaussian doesn't really care about the distance parameter here. And this already explains why numerically people observe very fast convergence of compactor series expansions up to very small values of uh, this s. Simply because you have a series which with coefficients which decay like a Gaussian, or almost like a Gaussian. Uh, so concerning the time-like regime, it's of course doable by the same methods, uh, with the caveat that you need to consider integration of some slight, uh, slight deformed curve. So this would add up maybe some technicalities in the analysis, but I have no doubt that the conclusion about convergence will be the same. The second, the second next point uh, I want to mention, so here I consider just vacuum to vacuum expectation values. There's no problem to put two uh, states corresponding to different rapidities in coming uh, particles. And this kind of uh, average is the average you need to have that local operators in your model form an algebra, so you can multiply them, and the multiplication gives something finite. 
Uh, so, so the well-defined well operator product also follows so that the key side high the left. And because you have well-defined, the then you can apply the techniques analyzed uh, by Gamitov and Smirnov here to, to prove the local commutative theorem. They prove, provided the set of algebraic techniques, because you have to move certain contours and uh, compensate certain terms to have the vanishing of a commutator for space like uh, separated. Uh, operators, but they relied on the hypothesis of convergence of the series they were handling. And then, uh, well, you can, you can ask, does it work for multi-point functions? Uh, well, I didn't check this explicitly, but it, uh, you can write some uh, series of multiple integral representation for uh, multi-point functions, and the way this series is uh, structured, it, it's, uh, it, it, it looks definitely doable within them methods to prove the convergence in this case. Good. So, uh, so what other things, things can we uh, get from this, this, this convergence? So, I want to discuss maybe the point of view of special function theory on that. If we have special functions, then, um, well, the most elemental special functions are polynomials. Then we take units of polynomials. And you get transcendental functions call sign, exponent, and etc. Then we can integrate those transcendental functions and we get higher transcendental functions. So functions that we have more uh, properties, uh, structure, like the gamma function, high class half geometric functions, or actually a bunch of many other functions. And they are already more constructionally more, 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 more complicated. But you can go one step up, and you can go to the Panavier class. So of course the Panavier class contains the Panavier transcendents, but well, actually, it contains, it can basically contains the trick home determinants of operators identity to zero, where he is an integrable uh, integral operator. And then this is more or less where the complexity stops. And you can ask yourself what is higher. Now, uh, what is the modern point of view on special functions? At least the transcendental ones, one to Panovi. Uh, well, the modern point of view is that actually special functions are nothing else but matrix elements of representations of uh, Lie groups or, more generally, certain algebraic structure. This is the point of view which was first, of, uh, first advocated by uh, Bradman, where he realized, I think, uh, uh, some special functions have some representation as a representation of some specifically matrix elements of some specifically group, and this was really pushed up to a full uh, industry by Lenin and collaborators in the and collaborators between the 70s and 80s. And up to that, one can say uh, that it's rather well understood how this connection happens. So for instance, special functions are nothing else but matrix elements of representations of the motion group on R2. And the representation is this on the space of square integrable functions on this sphere. So you have the representation, which I don't want to discuss, labeled by an auxiliary parameter rho. You evaluate it on a group element, which can be parameterized by the rotation and the parameters of the translation in the motion group. And you take the scalar products between two uh, exponents of e to the i n to pi. So up to adjusting by a phase e and phi, you get nothing else but the best of function whose integral representation I present here. So and this is actually a much more structural uh, way of seeing special functions because then you want to construct special functions. You don't have to look at the top. You just uh, construct some algebraic structure, construct representation theory of it, compute the matrix elements, and you ensure you have special functions. And all the properties of special functions like Integrals of products of two special functions and etc. They just appear as translation of the morphism property of the representation. You have the same for pan for pan So, for instance, a tau function of pan for it can be realized as a four-point function of vertex operator in a sequel one CFT. So you take products of vertex operators whose uh, scaling dimensions depend on uh, the parameters of pan uh, localized at some specific points, you average the CFT vacuum, and you get the tower uh, function. Thank you. And, uh, and this is also actually not the only instance of Panlevé. 
because generically what you see from the various works which were done since uh, the 80s is that correlation functions of quantum integral homomorphs have their inverted point. So be it the XF chain, the nonlinear Schrodinger model at infinite coupling, uh, or the sign Gordon at the Fermion point, they give rise to various instances of the kind of transcendence, well, yeah, and, and also in the Gaussian model. For example, in order to find the dimensional sign Gordon quantum field theory at the free fermion point, so it corresponds to the quantization of this classical evolution equation, then if you consider the Euclidean two point function of this theory at the free fermion point, expectation value in the vacuum of the exponents of the field, then up to some constants, here's the tau function of time of the where r is the sum of x squared of d squared because we are Euclidean. So, then, if we, uh, how can we see a correlation functions, how can we see correlation functions of quantum integrable models outside of the free fermion point? Well, a given quantum integrable model outside of the free fermion point is basically, you take a representation of a quantum group, uh, because it's outside of the free fermion point, the group is uh, non-trivial, and you compute the matrix elements. So what you are doing, you're just computing another special function. And many examples of this. So all the plethora of massive integrable quantum field uh, theories provide you with some new classes of special functions. And these special functions, they have specific, uh, very rich classes of uh, properties. Likewise, for that, this model, the XXZ chain on the Schrodinger model, Many, many other examples, also in... in. Uh, and then, well, if, for instance, you would, take, you would put yourself in the sign Gordon case, because at the free fermion point, the uh, two-point function is the tau function of the three, then if you move the coupling constants where the, when the model becomes slowly in action, you get one parameter deformation of tau of the three. And, and then, then from the various analysis uh, I was performing for the properties of correlators on the XAC side, but similar properties I expected to hold on the sign on side, then really the functions you obtain by this one during the deformation, they have structural properties which go way beyond what you can see from the class. So, uh, so from such kind of representations, you really get the access to what would uh, lie here. And, and then, then the point, point you need to um, the point you need to be really speaking of well defined functions is that typically these functions are defined well just as you define the free form determinant as a series of multiple integrals, the functions you have which appear here from quantum integrable models, they are series of multiple integrals. And if you want to have a well defined special function theory lying beyond the kind of the class, you need to solve the convergence problems for all that. And so, so I think I uh, arrived more or less to the end of the talk. So, so I will not go into the details of the techniques. If somebody is interested, then I will be happy, very happy to explain it on the, on the blackboard. But basically, these techniques are some uh, sophistications and uh, further development of what is done on the random matrix side. So the result I presented was that I would manage to set up a method which allows you to prove convergence of more factor series expansions in the one plus one dimensional cinch Gordon field theory, but I have good hopes that the method is, because it, it, it's really quite universal in the way it's applied, that it's applicable to many other cases. Uh, well, the, on the technical side, developing the method, the method is to invent some techniques which allow you to deal with some n-dimensional integrals uh, which have highly non-trivial couplings between the integration variables. And this was a concatenation of large deviation uh, theory, concentration of measure techniques, human Hilbert problems, and potential theory, and then and also soft analysis uh, tools. Uh, and, and then, then what, I, what I would like to push all this further is just to apply this to the sign Gordon quantum field theory precisely because then one would get this um, one parameter deformation of the tau function of time of the three by considering the vacuum expectation values of exponents of 
the field, and then apply the technique that is quantum detectable models like the XFC chain, or probably the method would need to be slightly accommodated, but in principle is applicable. Thank you for your attention. Can you say something about the short distance behavior of the point function? No, no, it's, it's, it's uh, beyond the grasp. The point is that uh, to say something about short distance, uh, you should uh, have the control in uh, this. Uh, so basically, you have this multiple integral. R is the distance, alpha is the ratio of the distance to time. And to say something about short distance, you should know, uh, because in the, the short distance, distance limit, the two point function should go like there to some power alpha. alpha. So, so typically, uh, maybe, maybe after taking the derivative of the series, the series will diverge with some power law in alpha uh, in the distance. And to have a control on that, you should have a control on really how you n of r alpha behaves. Uh, up to the, the constant term here. Yeah. So, so here there's a whole series, like one over log n, and, and etc. You should control all this series up to all the one term, in particular the dependence on r and alpha. And if you're able to do that, then, then, then you can say something about short distance asymptotics. But uh, in the way the method is devised now, this is still uh, beyond, beyond the grasp. It's, it's, it's technically extremely hard to go beyond the the leading term, or at least up to the constant, which would be important for the short distance asymptotics. But then for the short distance asymptotics, you could hope to, device, to, to build on uh, other techniques. So the exponent of the field two point function was written by Gaslavnov and Krepin as a fit home determinant of uh, dual fields and average in the dual vacuum. And then, well, well this, this kind of representation is really quite uh, formal. Uh, it makes a connection between the series of uh, form factors and a certain fit home determinant, which can be analyzed by a Riemann Hibbert uh, problem. And then, uh, maybe building on the techniques I developed with, with, with my collaborators to deal with the XAV chain, it should be possible to extract the asymptotics using. Uh, uh, some Riemann Hubbard problem techniques and some multi dimensional flow techniques, which basically allow you to really make sense of this dual field uh, vacuum expectation value. And now everything would be in control because convergence is, is in control. But still, it would be a long program to get to there. So, so he had this one over B or one minus B? So, he had this one half minus B. Special functions for the people that they need to see the score. Special functions when you have to characterize by some features like addition theories or uh, the functions or some transformation theory, mm -hmm. or transformations, things like that. Can you see that here? Or the uh, uh, so, uh, well, actually, the, 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 the way to see uh, some. Uh, sort of addition theorems uh, or, or, or transformation properties of the special functions on the, uh, they will follow up actually from the representation theory. So, or, or from, from you can, from what you can implement from the, uh, from the property of the QFT on the level of the correlator. So I don't know, so in translation invariance, it would manifest itself in some way on the uh, special functions. So probably you wouldn't get all the informations and addition theorems you would get by uh, using the algebraic input, for instance, to construct various, um, so, uh, so you have various representation states for the Bessel functions, uh, uh, one integral or another one, and usually it's very hard to pass from one to the other, but then, say, for the sign golden case, you would have uh, uh, some form factors, and you have many representations for the form factors, so like through the p-function method, you have one series representation for the tau function, then the free field representation, or the results of Smirnov provides yet another representation, so it would be more like the integrability techniques then give you access to many ways to write this, this function and then relate these 
different series expansions. Which, if you would, somebody would just give you series expansion with a k function written as a determinant and a k function written like that, you wouldn't a priori know how to relate to it. Carol, I think that uh, before the next question, I think there is some entanglement between the, the, yeah, the, the, the microphone and the, okay, the wire. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, can, can I ask one more? Yeah. Uh, so, for me, you can say uh, in presentation theoretic approach starting from quantum groups to, uh, to integrable field theories is the, the work of, uh, of uh, Bajan of the Kermit of Rajput, where they start from the quantum group, uh, then have these interdimensional representations and so get something. <laughs> uh, so this so, so then and this will be based on uh, using using uh, functional functional equations which arise from representation like was an all uh, TQ equations and their generalizations. So, would they show up here? I mean, uh, mm, I, 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 maybe Lilian, uh, and then we'll come back to that. So, do you count as a connection to one fundamental theory you keep? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, okay, so. Uh, um, Yeah, so t t the typical random matrix um, integral is some integral of Rn with the van der Mond raised to the power beta times to the minus n times some potential. And then, uh, well, I won't go into the details, but if we start with the n-dimensional integrals, uh, which I have written down, you can perform some upper bounds uh, on, on the integrand, and you write it as, uh, it's, it's bounded as um, some uh, partition function where you should take the maximum of its values uh, where p ranges from 1 to n. And this partition function is a two, uh, uh, two-fold integrals over variables nu over rp and variables lambda over r minus n rp, which uh, have uh, one-body interactions and two-body interactions, which are maybe not as explicit as in the random matrix case, because basically this w is a generic two-body you can consider it as a generic two-body interaction, and the one-body potential is, is um, uh, explicit, like a Cauch Cauch term. But, and maybe the difference with, with random matrix theory that you consider quantities which have no scaling in n explicit, like uh, like in this case here, where basically the two-body interaction is of the same order immediately as the one-body confining part. But you have to deal with some uh, two-body interactions which have a non-trivial scaling in n, to n is log n, and uh, likewise for the one body. Can you see anything interesting when v goes to one half? Um, that that yes. was recently a claim that this is basically it should be a free boson. Uh, yes, so actually when B goes to one half, so then B hat goes to zero, so something is happening. Because the control here is also... No, 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 I, I would like to go to the self-dual one, maybe. To the self ah, so B goes one quarter. B, B hat, I guess, or something. Yes, so, so it's B, B goes one quarter. Uh, in principle, no. Uh, At least immediately, I wouldn't, wouldn't see something, uh, some, some tremendous simplification, but maybe may, may there is. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think we should stop here. Uh, let's thank Carol again.